In Revelation 13, we're more than halfway through the book, plowing through here. Here in Revelation 13, two beasts are introduced and talked about. Uh, the first beast in verse 1, the second beast in verse 11. Uh, these two beasts are intimately related to each other, as we shall see as we go through here. I plan on spending two sermons on this chapter. So I'll cover verses 1 through 10 this week and verses 11 through to the end, verse 18 next week. Um, so this morning I want to read verses 1 through 10. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word and then we'll go through these verses and see what is being talked about here in chapter 13 regarding uh, these beasts. Scripture reads, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my sermon is, the beast. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for this time in your word this morning. We ask that you use it for good, that people would be able to understand what's being said here in the book of Revelation more fully. God, we live in a culture of Christianity uh, which teaches crazy things about this chapter. We also live in a culture of Christianity where many don't even want to look at the book of Revelation because of all the crazy things that have been said over the years. Lord, we just ask and pray that as we go through this passage, that you would use it for good in our lives, that we would understand what it's talking about, and that we would understand your ways and your thoughts better, and see just how great your kingdom is, O oh God, and how faithful your saints are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. Here in verse 1, the scripture starts out and says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads, each of the seven heads, a blasphemous name. Many futurists, those who think that everything that's written here in the book of Revelation is yet to take place in the future, many futurists view this beast as some form of a revived Roman Empire, or as being the Antichrist himself. Many futurists view this beast as some form of a revived Roman Empire, or as being the Antichrist himself. Our contention here this morning is that what is spoken of here in Revelation is no longer future, but rather took place back in the 60s A.D. My contention is that this speaks of the Roman Empire and of the Emperor of Rome not of a revived Roman Empire or the Antichrist. They are interchangeable, of course, as the emperor represents Rome. What could possibly, here in verse 1, bring us to the idea that this beast represents Rome itself? Or, as the futurists view it, some revived Roman Empire. What could possibly, here in verse 1, bring us to this idea that this beast represents Rome itself? Well, by looking at Revelation 17, we get a better picture or a more fuller picture or more details about this beast. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 17. Keep your finger in there. Because the beast comes up again in chapter 17, this same beast. 
talk about here in Revelation 13, 1 is talked about again in Revelation 17. Verse 3 says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. Remember, our beast in the 13, 1 has a blasphemous name on each head. Which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the same beast. And all are agreed on this, whether futurist or preterist, all are agreed. The beast of Revelation 13 is the same beast spoken of here in chapter 17. And some details given and in verse 7 of chapter 17 here it says, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. And he reveals some things about this beast and woman. Look at verse 9. He says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Rome is known as what? The city on seven hills. The city on seven hills. Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Also notice the next part of what the angel says in verse 10, which the mind of wisdom should pick up on to understand what's being spoken of here. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. Not only does the angel associate this beast with seven hills or mountains, but also with seven kings. This too fits perfectly with the time in which we contend all this took place, namely in the 60s A.D. The angel says five kings have fallen. This would be the first five emperors of Rome who had since died namely Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius Caesar, Gaius or Caligula Caesar, and Claudius Caesar. Those five. Now, some try to say, oh, Julius Caesar wasn't actually an emperor. Now, I can refute that easy enough as there's tons of historical precedent that Julius Caesar was, in fact, the first emperor of Rome. And I'd be glad to contend with that with you in private. I didn't want to go into all that history because this is already going to be a lengthy sermon. The sixth king, the angel says, is, one is, notice that there in verse 10, five have fallen, one is. This would be referring to Nero, who was the sixth emperor of Rome, who was alive when all this was fulfilled and took place during the 60s A.D., Nero was also the first emperor to persecute the Christians wholesale and whose authority also commissioned Roman general Vespasian to attack and destroy Jerusalem. And of course, the temple was annihilated. The angel then says that one king is yet to come, the seventh king, and his time will be a short time, it says there in verse 10. The emperor after Nero was Galba, He was, in fact, the shortest reigning emperor up until that time. He reigned for only six months, and then he was killed. All these other emperors had reigned for years. Nero reigned for 14 before him. His time was short. It was only six months, and he was dead. So based on what is said in verses 9 and 10 regarding these beasts, the seven heads representing seven mountains or hills, and Rome being known as the city on seven hills, and the fact that these seven heads also represent seven kings, and it fitting perfectly into the timeline of what we're portending here, it fulfills. There we see Rome. The beast is Rome, the Roman Empire. And it's also why some futurists view it as a revived empire, Rome, because they see it clearly as talking about Rome also, here in chapter 13, being the beast. You can go back to Romans 13, uh, to Revelation 13 there. So this leads us to believe that this speaks of Rome being the beast and that it speaks of Rome at the time we contend all this was fulfilled in the 60s AD. 
We contend that the beast was the Roman Empire slash Roman Emperor, and that it has all since long past been fulfilled. I contend that it was the Roman Empire, not some yet future revived Roman Empire, and that it was the Roman Emperor Nero Caesar, that this was the beast that is spoken of in Revelation 13. The beast, who is associated by many futurists as being the Antichrist, which, by the way, there's no biblical precedent for ever referring to the beast as the Antichrist, and I plan on doing a sermon later just on that whole issue. The beast, who is associated by many futurists as being the Antichrist, are forever changing who they believe the Antichrist is in fulfillment of Revelation 13. One book I have, a guy documents over 100 individuals who have been proffered by the futurists over the years as who the Antichrist would be, and every one of them turns out to be wrong. They all die and go to the grave. The latest Antichrist proffering, you may recall, is Obama. All over the Internet, people saying, Obama is Antichrist. In the past, they have put forth Hitler in a rather convincing manner, I might add. They put forth Hitler. Because often when you look at Scripture, prophetic Scripture, you can take characteristics of it and find application to the present day, even though it has nothing to do directly with the prophecies of old. They put forth Hitler, but obviously it turned out not to be him. He's dead too. They even put forth Ronald Reagan as being the Antichrist. I remember that when I was a younger man. Because 666, Ronald Wilson Reagan. So from that, six letters in each of his three names. So 666. So they even put forth Ronald Reagan as being the Antichrist. Some futurists did. He's dead too. <laughs> it turned out not to be him either. Turned out not to be him either. Turned out to be wrong. These modern day guesses are nonsense. And how many times can you be fooled before you wake up and smell the coffee that somebody's selling you something and it ain't good for you? These modern day guesses are nonsense. What meaning would they have had to those who this book was written? None. Again, John said that the things he wrote about concerning this prophecy, this book of Revelation, he said, quote, must shortly take place, must shortly take place, that, quote, the time was near, that, quote, the time was at hand, and remember he was told not to seal up the prophecy because of this, not seal up the prophecy because of this. These words of wisdom, this insight, this prophecy was for the first century Christians that it was delivered to. Of what was coming shortly, not 2,000 years later, plus and counting in our day and age. It was for them. They were the ones, these first century Christians were the ones who were to understand, look at verse 18 of chapter 13, here is wisdom. Remember we saw that in chapter 17. Here is wisdom. You're supposed to figure some things out here. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It was they who were to understand and calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. They were the ones to calculate it. Not us in our day. What meaning would it have had to them? The things people do today to try to figure out, because it's still coming, who the Antichrist is, who this beast is, would have no meaning to them. It's an absurdity. An absurdity. Remember, these first century Christians John was writing to were given this prophecy. As it says at the very beginning of the book, in chapter 1, verse 1, quote, God gave to show His servants things which must shortly take place. He gave it to show them, the first century Christian readers of this prophecy. 
So all these modern day guesses are nonsense. What meaning would these modern day guesses have to those whom this book was written? None. Hence we can be assured all 100% modern day guesses are wrong. You can look really good to your friends. Next time the latest one comes out of who they think the Antichrist is, you can tell them, I don't believe that. You watch, it's going to be wrong. And they'll notice you're right. Because eventually the person will croak or something like that will happen. Or else somebody else will be started to be proffered and they'll forget about that person. Maybe after two or three of those, people start thinking, man, this guy's pretty good. Maybe he does know about prophetic things regarding the book of Revelation. Mark my words, just as I told you, the temple will never be rebuilt and they'll start sacrificing animals again. Never. All 100% of Antichrist predictions are wrong and will always be wrong. We contend that the beast was the Roman Empire slash Roman Emperor. Now, I want to make a comment about the amillennialists. Because remember, I'm studying a lot of scholars from various eschatological and theological camps regarding this end time stuff. The amillennialists take Revelation 13 and they just, you know, make it all figurative and reoccurring. These are just things that reoccur, you know, down through history. It isn't talking about specific people or specific time. It's just a reoccurring theme. What's impossible for me to accept regarding their contentions, however, is that the nature of all biblical prophecy is talking about specific events regarding specific people. It's just the nature of biblical prophecy when you read Scripture is talking about specific events and specific people. So to say this is all just figurative and reoccurring and really doesn't, it really just isn't, It's just talking about themes, is what they say. I just don't buy it. On this basis alone, I cannot embrace the amillennialist interpretive view of this chapter and of other chapters. While you can readily see, listen to me now, while you can readily see characteristics of prophecies that you can, that you can see analogous to present day characteristics, you can do this with many Old Testament prophecies. I could take you, and haven't we done this in the past when we've gone through Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and you can see analogies between his time and our time today. Right? Well, you can readily see characteristics of prophecies that you can see analogous to the present day characteristics. They are not the fulfillment of the specific events and people that the prophecy addresses. And so that is with the case when it comes to Revelation. And I've even heard this from some people here. Well, you can see things today that are, seem analogous to what's being said in Revelation. Of course you can. It's that way with all prophetic language. But the truth of the matter is all prophetic language addresses a specific people and a specific event. It's the nature of biblical prophecy. I contend that it was Rome that was the beast. That Rome... And Nero were the beasts spoken of in Revelation 13. And that the first century church understood it as such. Now as we continue in this chapter, we will see, we'll see more, far more than we've already seen that this must be speaking of Rome during the 60s AD and of Nero. Don't think I'm going to let it rest on that little evidence I gave just from verse 1 and what I said there. So let's continue on here. Notice that this beast has seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. This surely shows that the beast got his power and authority from the dragon. Remember the dragon? Look back at chapter 12, verse 3. Notice how similar the dragon and the beast are in how they are defined in the book of Revelation. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, Ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Same thing. Seven heads, crown on each head, ten horns. The beast and the dragon are defined as the same in their nature, in their appearance, in their characteristics. Who was the dragon? 
Remember in chapter 12, verse 9? So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Remember, it was Satan himself. That's who the dragon is. And the scripture is clear. That is where the beast got his power and authority. It was from the devil himself, from Satan himself. Look what it says in verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The beast derived his authority and power from Satan himself. Okay, we see that in that they're both defined the same in their characteristics of what they look like. And we see it clearly stated here, right in verse 2 of chapter 13. In Scripture and other Old Testament era writings, animal horns, we got ten horns on this beast, pictured political authority and military strength, both of which Rome clearly possessed. Rome is the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 2. Get my sermon if you forget about all that. Rome is the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 2, which of course led up to the inauguration of the kingdom of Christ, which is what we're saying Revelation is all about, the inaugural of his kingdom. Notice the ferocious nature of the beast. Verse 2, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Rome was this way. Rome is the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. Rome is the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. Remember what was said of Rome there? And of course, we saw historically that Rome, being the fourth beast, led up to the time where Christ would be crucified and his kingdom would begin in the earth. And remember what was said of Rome there as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7? Quote, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. No wonder people said of the beast in Revelation 13, as it says in verse 4, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now notice what verse 3 says here in Revelation 13. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. The futurists love this verse. Many of them take this verse and say that this means the Antichrist, who somehow they associate with the beast here, even though there's no biblical warrant whatsoever to associate the beast as being the Antichrist. None whatsoever. Many of them say that this verse means the Antichrist dies and is resurrected from the dead. Have you heard that story? Of course you have. Ad nauseum. A million times. And because he dies and is resurrected, that's how he wins this worldwide following. And then the little false prophet who sits in his shoulder, you know, <laughs> you know, is the one who uh, gets everybody to follow the beast. And that's the second beast here of uh, Revelation 13, they say. Yeah. I have to ask, when I read verse 3, how do they get that out of this? And can they read simple English? The verse says, as. Does it not? And it's there in the Greek, as. And I saw one of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded. As having been slain. It wasn't actually killed. It was as. There was a wound, but he wasn't killed. Therefore, he didn't get resurrected. Verse 12 
says it was a deadly wound. See that? And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now think about resurrection. There are many people who survive a death wound. It's a common thing to have deadly wounds and live to tell the story. Verse 14 of chapter 13 says simply, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was never dead to begin with. He was wounded. And his wound was healed. Yet they get from that this Antichrist, this person who gets killed and is resurrected. And that's how he gets this great following, this worldwide following. You have to want to believe that. You have to want to read it in there. Because it isn't there just looking at the passage itself. It's a fantastic story that you have to want to make up. Want to believe, because you've heard so many other people say it. I remember not too long ago, we were watching some stuff on Christian TV. One of these end time things uh, that they made from this, I think, LaHaye's thing or some other end time people. And it's just crazy. (laughs) The whole thing is crazy. And I remember my kids asking me, you know, Dad, is this all really going to happen? And I told him, I said, no, it's a fairy tale. I said, it'll never happen and don't ever believe it. I said, it's a fantastic story which people love to tell without any biblical warrant to it whatsoever. That's what I tell my kids. I view it as being equal as telling my kids that Santa Claus is real. I wouldn't tell my kids Santa Claus is real and I ain't going to tell them this nonsense These fantastic stories that people have made up are real either. Because when you look at the Scripture, which you know what I've found since now I can debate these things, 98% of people who believe this popular eschatology, this futurist view, don't even know how to present it from Scripture, let alone defend their position from Scripture. Crazy. They just say it because they've heard it so many times from other people. So there's no need for this Antichrist dies and is risen from the dead scenario as the Scripture is not saying any such thing to begin with. That he ever did die. Nor is this death and resurrection the means whereby the beast gains a world following. As for our preterist friends, when it comes to verse 3, Those who, like us, say this was fulfilled back in the 60s A.D., some say this wounding had to do with a myth that after Nero killed himself, you all know that, Nero killed himself, drove his sword, his short stabbard into his neck, committed suicide. Some say this wounding had to do with the myth that after Nero killed himself by his own sword in 68 A.D., was started which said that he had risen from the dead and was coming back to conquer his enemies who had since installed Galba. That was a popular myth that he was coming back from the dead and that this was what verse 3 was referring to in regards to this wound. Others say that it has to do with the civil war that broke out in Rome prior to Nero's suicide. Did you know that there was civil war? In Rome, prior to Nero's suicide, huge civil war. And after he died, the civil war even got worse. And that's why you had such a quick succession of Roman emperors after that. You had three of them in a matter of three years after that. Because of what was going on. And then, when you read history, amazingly, Rome, that looked like it was utterly imploding on itself, regained its footing. And amazingly, restored order and continued on. So it was like it suffered this wound, and yet the empire continued to live on. That's what others say. I, after much study, reject both of these. 
because I do not see how they apply or fit into what is said here in Revelation 13. When you do your exegetical work and take these two things that these other preterists are saying, um, I just don't see how it works. For example, the 42 months spoken of in verse 5 would then come after Nero's death, while in truth, as we shall see as we continue on, the 42 months clearly took place while Nero was still alive. So I don't buy it. I rather embrace Irenaeus' view. Irenaeus was the early church father. I embrace his view. It's a view that has been held by churchmen down through the centuries, including good scholars and churchmen of our day. That view is the view that the head wound is a reference to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Are you listening? Because you've got to pay attention at this point. It's a reference to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Remember, this was the first prophetic word about Christ here in Genesis chapter 3. Verse 15, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, you being Satan, the dragon, the one who's behind the beast, power. Between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he, talking about Christ, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Amen? This is what Irena said the head wound is referring to of what was said here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The dragon who gave the beast his power, was wounded. The beast's head was wounded. Genesis 3.15 Here we see in Revelation 13 that the dragon, Satan himself, and the beast are innately connected. Do we not see this? They are similar in their characteristics as we saw in chapter 12 and in chapter 13. They are both worshipped in verse 4 of chapter 13. It says, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast, it says in verse 4. In truth, the beast is a physical manifestation of the dragon's power and authority. The beast is a physical manifestation of the dragon's power and authority. So I clearly see the connection Irenaeus and other churchmen have made down through the centuries, including our own. The Scriptures are clear that only Christ and His kingdom could bruise the head of the devil. The Scriptures are clear here in Revelation that Jesus and His faithful followers are the only sufficient opponents of the devil. You can mark down Revelation 12, 11, Revelation 19, uh, 21. Probably got a typo there. See me about that. And that through his finished work at Calvary was this possible that the devil could be conquered. Revelation 1 5. Revelation 5 9. And again, Revelation 12 11. This truth is made clear not only in Revelation but throughout Scripture. That Christ through his finished work of Calvary bruised the head of the dragon. Other places in Scripture, you can look at Luke 10, 17 through 24. Luke 10, 17 through 24. Luke 11, 14 through 22. Luke 11, 14 through 22. John 12, 31 through 33. John 12, 31 through 33. Colossians 2, 15, and we could go on and on. Now listen, stick with me on this. Let me show you how this practically works out in regards to our time frame of the 60s A.D. I submit to you that it was Christ, His kingdom, and Christianity, His faithful followers, which wounded the beast's head. Consider the facts. Christianity spread rapidly throughout the Roman Empire during the early years, did it not? 
Churches sprang up everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. How do you think we got all these different books to all these different geographical areas like Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians? All through the Roman Empire, churches sprang up everywhere. There was huge, a huge impact upon the entire Roman Empire by Christianity. Thousands upon thousands were won to Christ. We know in the book of Revelation alone, the very first time the message was preached, 3,000 converted to Christ. That was just in Jerusalem. And it spread out from there all through the Roman Empire. Thousands upon thousands were won to Christ, so much so that even members of Caesar's own household believed in Jesus. Mark down Philippians 4.22. says it that plainly. Greet the members of Caesar's own household. Such a huge impact Christianity had upon the Roman Empire. Thousands upon thousands of churches springing up everywhere. Even members of Caesar's own household converted to Christ. And we know historically that Tiberius Caesar, who reigned from 14 A.D. to 37 A.D., he actually prompted the Roman Senate and asked them to recognize the divinity of Jesus. Did you know that? That is how huge of an impact Christianity had upon the entire Roman Empire. Christians were multiplying like rabbits. People were being converted to the faith. This is what is meant by the beast being wounded in light of Genesis 3.15. Christ's kingdom had an impact upon the Roman Empire, which is the beast, wounding the beast's head. Because Christ's kingdom was expanding throughout the Roman Empire. But, the tables turned, as it says... I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. The beast's wound from the kingdom of Christ was healed. Nero came on the scene. There have been little spatterings of persecution here and there, very little, in certain geographical areas by certain magistrates throughout the Roman Empire prior to this. Nero is the first emperor who made the persecution of Christians a worldwide event. And his persecution was horrific. The beast, as it says in verse 3, deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled at his ferocity and great glory as he made war against the saints as it says in verse 7, because that's what the beast did. He made war against the saints. Just read the historic accounts of the persecution of Christians by Nero. This is what is meant by the wound was healed of the beast. He strengthened his power. Christianity was having a huge impact. The head was wounded. The wound was healed. Nero came on the scene. Persecuted the saints of God. Attack the kingdom of Christ in the earth. Now before we move on here from verse 3 and continue on, notice the end of verse 3 says, quote, All the world marveled and followed the beast. Unquote. The futurists make much of this falsely also. They say that this beast, the Antichrist, must have a world following. As though in some comprehensive sense, every last person on earth must follow the beast. And I've dealt with this before, this whole nonsense of thinking things with, say, all or every, mean it comprehensively. It's dumb, stupid, and ridiculous. It doesn't always mean all and every comprehensively. The context determines what it is. Therefore, they say, so it couldn't have been the Roman Empire because they didn't rule every last person on the planet comprehensively. 
As it says in verse 7, they point out, first end of verse 3, that the world marveled and followed the beast. And then they point out the end of verse 7, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And they say it can't be the Roman Empire because they didn't rule over every tribe, tongue, and nation. They didn't rule the whole world, they say. But the truth is, this was the historic testimony of Rome at that time. That it did rule the whole world over every tribe, tongue, and nation. For example, Josephus, the historian Josephus from that era, calls the Romans, quote, the rulers of the whole world. This was the historic testimony of Rome at that time, that they did in fact rule the whole world, which the writers of the, which the hearers of this prophecy living in the first century would have readily recognized that this was talking about Rome because they were the ones who ruled the whole world. Josephus also said of the Romans, he said, quote, the lords of the inhabitable earth, unquote. That's what he referred to the Roman Empire, to the Romans as. The lords of the inhabitable earth earth. The first century Jewish philosopher Philo says that Rome had, quote, sovereignty of the most numerous and most valuable and important portions of the habitable world, which in fact one may fairly call the whole world. This was the testimony, the historic testimony of Rome at that time, that they did in fact rule the whole world of which the hearers of this prophecy living in the first century would have readily recognized. So again, the futurists have egg on their face. Now verse 4 goes on and says, So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Emperor worship was huge at this time, was it not? Worshipping the Roman Empire and the Emperor himself as being divine. Did we not see this from our earlier messages when we addressed the seven churches in this book? You saw temples of Emperor worship at many of the cities where these churches were. Verse 5 says, And he was given a mouth through Nero. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Here we see in verses 5 through 7 that the beast was given a mouth through Nero to speak blasphemy and to continue for 42 months. Verses 6 and 7 then read that he did blaspheme and that he made war during these 42 months. He made war against the saints and did overcome them. This is exactly what Nero did do. He did speak blasphemy against God and he did make war against the saints for 42 months. Let's cover both of these. The blasphemy and the persecution of the saints for 42 months. Regarding the blasphemy, for example, and I could go on, I always, when I say for example, because there's many other examples, okay? (laughs) For example, emperor worship, as we have seen earlier in this book, had already been well established in the Roman Empire by the time Nero became emperor. We know that historically. We also know historically that Nero had images of himself made wherein people paid them homage and reverence. We know historically that Nero had money coined that had the image of his head with sun rays radiating from his head, thus imitating the Roman sun god Apollo. The money had the inscription on it which read, quote, 
all-powerful Nero Caesar Sebastus, the new Apollo, unquote. We know that in 66 AD, Tiridates, the king of Armenia, worshipped Nero and declared amongst other blasphemous things, quote, I have come to thee, my God, to worship thee as I do Mithras. Mithras was a, a huge uh, false god at that time. Probably the biggest god competing with the claims of Christ during that era. And here's some other king worshiping Nero. I have come to thee, my God, to worship thee as I do Mithras. The destiny you spin for me shall be mine, for you are my fortune and my fate. Nero did speak blasphemies. Regarding the 42 months of persecution of the saints, we know from historical records that Nero's persecution of the Christians began in November of 64 A.D. The persecution of the Christians began in 64 A.D. We also know historically that Nero died in early June 68 A.D. What does that add up to? 42 to 43 months. About a 42-month period, the persecution ended, historians say, with Nero's death or shortly before his death. Because of the civil war that had broken out within the empire. Do you see why I'm pointing to Rome? Do you see why I'm pointing to Nero? Because it makes sense. It fits. The Roman historian Tacitus said the number of Christians Nero murdered was, quote-unquote, an immense number. He said, quote, Nero inflicted unheard of punishments on those who were commonly called Christians, unquote. By all accounts we have historically, Nero's persecution of the Christians was massive compared to Domitian's uh, um, persecution of the Christians at the end of the first century, which the futurists say is when John wrote. The Christian, Clement of Rome, who lived during this time, wrote of, quote, a vast number of the elect unquote, who died under Nero. We know that both Peter and Paul died under Nero's persecution. This 42-month period is not to be confused with the 42-month period spoken of in Revelation 11.2 or Revelation 12.14. That was addressing the annihilation of the Jews, which the Christians in Jerusalem would escape by going to Pella, as Christ himself also predicted they would. Remember? The fleet of the wilderness. Here in Revelation 13, it's addressing the persecution of the Christians under Nero, both in Rome and in various parts of the empire. When it came to the Jerusalem Christians, with the 42 months that took place there and the annihilation of natural Israel, the Christians escaped the persecution and didn't get harmed. Here, they did get harmed. We know it from the prophecy here in Revelation 13. We know it by historical fact. It having been fulfilled since then. Since John wrote it. Verse 8 says, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Only those who loved Christ and were willing to be martyred would, would stay true to Him and not follow the trend of the day in worshiping the emperor. This is a common theme both in Old Testament and New Testament Scripture as well as throughout church history. And may we be those types of people of God in our day and stay true to Him and not go along with the idolatrous trends of our day. Verse 9 says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is the only place in Scripture this term is used besides to the seven churches. Remember it was used to the seven churches at the beginning of this book? The ones who this book was 
addressed to? So we probably want to listen up, right? (laughs) Verse 10 says, He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. There is much written by scholars about this verse. And I'm left, what is the, I'm left thinking, what is the big deal? Why are they having such a hard time trying to figure out what this is talking about? To me, it's plain as sea spot run, what it's talking about, in my mind. What it's talking about is the simple fact that eventually God brings His righteous judgment upon those who persecute and kill His people. Haven't we seen that over and over again in the Old Testament? People, either of their own volition, well, it's always of their own volition, but God using them or not, attack God's people, persecute God's people, and God always brings retribution upon them for doing that to His people. Does He not? Eventually, God brings His righteous judgment upon those who persecute and kill His people. Hence, the need for patience by God's people and perseverance in the faith. Amen? Amen? It says, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. In other words, the one who's attacking the saints, harming the saints, persecuting the saints, he himself shall be judged. They themselves shall be judged. And then it says, he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. The one attacking the saints, harming the saints, persecuting the saints, will one day suffer judgment themselves. When it comes to Nero, he actually stuck a sword right through his own throat. And, of course, eventually the entire Roman Empire fell in time and space. Hence the need for patience. Here he says, here is the patience and the faith of the saints. To be patient during times of persecution. To me, it's just so plain. I was like, hello. (laughs) Very plain. Payback or payday doesn't always come on Friday. Things will be bad for God's people regarding the Roman persecution through Nero, but eventually both Nero and Rome would be judged and the saints avenged. Amen? That's what it's saying. Plain and simply. Praise the holy name. My contention is is that this beast represents the Roman Empire and Nero. And next week we'll look as we continue on where the second beast is talked about, verses 11 through 18. Stand up, we'll close in a word of prayer. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we give thanks and praise to You that we have this time to look at Your Scriptures, to work our way through each, each verse, O oh God, and come to a conclusion as to what it's saying. I ask and pray, O Lord, that each one here would take time to look these things over, to delve into these things, to show themselves as student of study also. Lord, I ask and pray that you use what was preached here for good in each of our lives, that we would see clearly that the book of Revelation is not about the end, but rather it's about a beginning, namely the beginning of Christ's kingdom in the earth the inaugural, the expansion, the conquering kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we see that we aren't just going to fade out through a rapture because things are going to get worse and worse and worse. May we see that we are to fight and be ambassadors and soldiers in His kingdom, declaring the truth of His word and His holy law Great salvation to the nations. Hallelujah, O Lord. Praise your holy name. All glory and honor unto you. Lord, break the faintness of heart that has gripped the American church because of the false eschatological teachings it has fed on for over a hundred years now. May we see him who we serve for who He is. And may we live in accordance with His Word. May we be used by You in the earth to see Your kingdom expanded, to see Your truth, Your 
law, your word, your great salvation known in this earth. Even as we saw in the last song that we sang this morning, O God, truly this is right. That you reign amongst the nations. Praise your holy name. Glory and honor unto you. All praise and adoration to you, O Lord. May we pick up our swords, which is your word, and may we do battle with him who has been bruised in the head, with him who has been conquered at Calvary, and may we be faithful to you till that great getting up morning. And God, I just ask and pray that you be glorified through each of our lives that we would live them in service to you, not in obscurity, daily checking our prophecy charts, but out in the public square making you known to others and heralding your kingdom. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May his name be praised. You could be seated. We're going to take communion at this time, and you can feel free to take communion with us. As long as you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion. But as long as you're a Christian, feel free to partake at the Lord's table. This is something which believers in Christ observe. And you'll notice there's only two elements at his table. The bread, which represents his body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood. Amen? Notice there's these two elements at his table and nothing else. This signifies to us that it's through Christ alone, because of what He did at Calvary, that we have right standing with the Father. Praise His holy name. It's not these two elements plus a list of all my holy living or all my good deeds. Amen? This is the only two elements at His table. Now, when we know Him, we'll want to do good deeds. We want to live holy lives. Amen? But we don't use those things as a means whereby we obtain God's acceptance. We don't do good works to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do good works because we have obtained God's acceptance through faith in Christ alone. Amen? This time at His table reminds us of that important distinction. Praise His name. The Apostle Paul wrote and said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Praise His holy name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that You redeemed us unto Yourself, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with Your own precious blood. We ask and pray, O God, that we live our lives in obedience to You, that we would worship You, that we would glorify You, that we would enjoy You. Help each one here, O Lord, to draw close to you, I pray, in the days ahead. Be glorified through each of our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Praise His holy name. Stand and we'll worship Him. Hallelujah, God. Glory and honor unto You, O Lord. Father, I ask and pray that we go forth from this place renewed in our faith and our spirits. Lord, I just ask and pray that each man here would be a priest to his home and open Your Word to his wife and to his children this week instructing them from the Scriptures. I ask and pray, O God, that each woman 
but be a helpmate to her husband, understanding her role, a nurturer of the children, help each child, father, to be a blessing in the home, help each single person here to use their time and strength and service to you and not squander it on their own selfish pursuits. Help each grandparent and great-grandparent to be an example of holy living to their progeny. Lord, be glorified through each of our lives, I ask. Be with each of us. May your Holy Spirit be upon us. May we all draw close to you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise His name. Amen. Hey, I'm going to be writing a book. So, um... I wrote out the entire outline. I have all the chapters done. I'm doing it on the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine. 